This video is about American history. Thanks, kiddo. The United States was born on the east coast of North America. With time and independence, Americans expanded into the North American interior. When the whole interior was claimed and organized, some Americans began looking beyond North America, looking for global possessions that would transform the United States into an empire, similar to those of England and Spain and other European nations. This video is about American imperialism in general, and specifically about the Spanish-American War. Those European nations I mentioned had laid claim to much of the planet, but the growing weakness of the Spanish Empire presented a couple of areas of opportunity for the United States. Please pause the video and study this map. What do you notice about the United States' acquisition of territory between 1850 and 1920? You likely noticed that there was some activity in the 1850s. These land masses were claimed by citizens of the United States under a law passed by Congress that allowed Americans to take possession of previously unclaimed lands containing a substance called guano. Now guano is the excrement of cave-dwelling bats and seabirds, but people discovered that it was a highly efficient fertilizer. And in the United States especially, with its expansion into the North American interior, there was a high demand for fertilizer among its agricultural communities. But let's get back to the map. The next major territorial acquisition by the United States is Alaska in 1867. Secretary of State William Seward negotiated the purchase of Alaska from the Russian Tsar. As a Russian colony, Alaska was costing way more money than it made. The next major year of acquisition is 1898. Some islands were unilaterally taken by the United States. Others, like Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines, were all acquired by the United States from Spain as part of a treaty to end the Spanish-American War. The war was fought in two areas, principally, Cuba and the Philippines. Both were Spanish colonies, and both were in the midst of their own revolutions for independence. This video is going to focus mainly on Cuba and how the United States came to declare war on Spain. Cubans fought for their independence from Spain twice in the 1860s and 70s. By the early 1890s, Cuban revolutionaries were well aware of an American desire to acquire Cuba before it won its independence from Spain. Motivated in part to avoid exchanging one colonial power for another, the revolutionaries started the Cuban War of Independence in 1895. Very shortly after the war started, the Cubans' fears seemed justified. American politicians and newspapers started arguing that the United States had an obligation to protect the Cubans from oppressive Spanish colonial rule, as depicted in this political cartoon. Even more insulting to Cubans were those Americans who felt, as this political cartoon shows, that the Americans had an obligation to protect the Cubans from themselves and the Spanish. The Revolutionary War in Cuba dragged on for three years, affecting everyone on the island including Americans with economic interests there. After a series of violent protests in January of 1898, the American ambassador feared for the property of American citizens living in Cuba. He requested that the U.S. government send a symbol of America's support for its citizens abroad. The decision was to send a battleship, the USS Maine. By America's standards of the time, this was a mild demonstration of force. According to a list of interventions by American forces, the United States used military force regularly to quote-unquote protect American interests. Here are some of the military interventions in the second half of the 19th century. I've tried to include a number of actions in the 1850s to show that not all American activity was guano-motivated in that decade. You may choose to pause the video and have a better look at this list. Now let's return to Cuba. The USS Maine arrived in Havana Harbor on January 25th, 1898. The official reason given was that the ship was on a courtesy visit. The USS Maine was one of the newest battleships in the U.S. Navy. It had a crew of approximately 350 men. While the pretense was friendly, the subtext was that the United States would protect its economic interests and its citizens in Cuba with military force if necessary. 
Understanding that subtext is important because it helps to explain the United States' reaction to what happens next. According to some witnesses, around 9.30 on the night of February 15, 1898, one or two explosions aboard the main, depending on who you asked. Either way, shortly afterward, the ship was resting on the bottom of Havana Harbor, and 260 members of its crew were dead. Another six would die of wounds sustained in the explosion. The reaction from American newspapers was immediate immediate and belligerent. These clippings from the New York Journal, a paper owned by William Randolph Hearst, fomented the idea of a Spanish plot. For months before this event, the Journal and other papers had been running stories about Spanish atrocities in an effort to stir up support for a war against Spain. To its credit, the U.S. government hesitated. It convened a U.S. Navy Board of Inquiry to assess the damage to the USS Maine and what caused it. Unfortunately, it would be almost five weeks before they issued a report. In the meantime, everyone seemed to be wondering if the United States would declare war on Spain. Some were hoping, others were just wondering. In late March, the Navy Board of Inquiry determined that the blast was caused by a mine placed in the harbor. The board, however, did not feel it had sufficient evidence to identify what group, Spanish or Cuban, had placed the mine. For people like Hearst, the answer was clear. The Spanish. Songs like this one, Awake, United States, were written and performed to inspire support for a military response to the sinking of the Maine. Please pause the video for a moment to read this excerpt from the lyrics to this song. This song suggests another theory about who planted the mine, Cuban mercenaries paid by the Spanish government. Years later, another theory would be put forward by another Navy Board of Inquiry. It will blame the explosion on spontaneous combustion in one of the coal storage chambers on board, caused by exposing the coal to oxygen and extreme heat. In fact, there have been at least five investigations into the sinking of the main, and the findings go back and forth between a mine and spontaneous combustion. Whatever the cause, Spain appeared to be the perpetrator, and the pressure was mounting on President William McKinley to act. Remember the Maine went the call, to hell with Spain. In April, McKinley asked Congress to declare war on Spain to intervene in the revolutions in Cuba and the Philippines. In both theaters of war, the Spanish were outmatched. The United States Navy handily defeated the Spanish Navy around the Philippines on May 1, 1898. They then landed the Filipino Patriot leader, Emilio Aguinaldo, on the Philippines to join guerrilla forces against the Spanish. Aguinaldo would become the first president of the Philippines, only to be captured by American forces during the subsequent Philippine-American War of 1899-1901. to That's right, the people of the Philippines were fighting for independence from Spain. Then, the United States took the Philippines from Spain and held on to it like a colony. So one year after the Spanish-American War, the people of the Philippines declared and fought for their independence from the United States. Back in the Western Hemisphere, American forces landed in Cuba on June 22, 1898, and established a base at Guantanamo Bay. The military objective was Santiago, the capital city, just a few miles to the west. As you can see on this map, there were four major clashes outside Santiago and all of them were American victories. It should be noted that the Spanish forces in Cuba had been fighting the revolutionaries for three years, so while they were experienced troops, they were also worn down. The United States armed forces were fresh and eager for a fight. Perhaps the best example of that eagerness is Theodore Roosevelt. At the time that war was declared, he was assistant secretary to the Navy, a lofty administrative position given to him in part as a reward for his work on McKinley's campaign. When war was declared, Roosevelt resigned from the Navy Department and helped organize a volunteer cavalry regiment that would be called the Rough Riders. Roosevelt was an enthusiastic imperialist and believed that manhood was best demonstrated on the battlefield. He and his Rough Riders, in a brave but perhaps strategically unsound attempt to break through the Spanish lines, charged a Spanish defensive position on Kettle Hill. The charge was successful, 
and contributed to the American victory that day. While Roosevelt emerged from the battle unscathed, the attack resulted in nearly 100 of his soldiers being killed or wounded. Nonetheless, the Americans took the field and the Spanish would soon abandon Santiago and surrender the island of Cuba. Unfortunately, the numbers of Spanish and Cuban casualties is unknown. Part of the confusion is that the Spanish were fighting the Cuban revolutionaries before and during the war. On the American side, fewer than 100 killed and wounded in one attack during one battle may not seem like a large number. But only about 385 American soldiers were killed in the entire war. So about 10% of those deaths were in Roosevelt's charge. But, sadly, bullets were not the most deadly risk in this war. According to some sources, there were 5,462 American deaths during the war. Imagine that for a moment. 385 American soldiers die in combat, or from wounds suffered in combat. Another almost 5,000 men died from disease or other causes. That number is staggering. 93% of the deaths were not combat-related. One possible source of those other causes was American beef being supplied to the U.S. Army. In May of 1898, Armour & Company, a big meatpacking company out of Chicago, sold the Army 500,000 pounds of canned beef which had been sent to Liverpool a year before and returned. In the summer of 1898, an army inspector tested the armor meat, which had been stamped and approved by a government inspector. This second inspector found 751 cases containing rotten meat. In just the first 60 cases he opened, he found 14 tins had already burst open. The quotation that from the report is, the effervescent putrid contents of which were distributed all over the cases. Needless to say, thousands of soldiers got food poisoning. It is possible that some number of those men died from ingesting rotten beef. The number, though, is impossible to determine. The scandal created bad press for the meatpacking industry. The scandal started calls for government regulations on meatpacking companies. The first of those regulations would come into effect in 1906. The Spanish-American War lasted only three months. For some Americans, that was a symbol more of their military might than of Spain's military decline. Following their naval victory in the Philippines, American forces joined Filipino revolutionary forces and defeated the Spanish. The Treaty of Paris was signed in December of 1898. Spain surrendered Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines to the United States in exchange for $20 million. One interesting note about the Treaty of Paris is that no representatives of the Cuban revolutionaries were invited to participate in the negotiations. Now, that shouldn't surprise us, given what we've seen here in this video, but it is important to know who was left out. Back in Cuba, the fighting was over. American forces, however, would remain in Cuba as an occupying force. Officially, they were staying until Cuba could draft a new constitution, a process that the United States continuously meddled in. For example, in 1901, American forces refused to leave Cuba until the island nation agreed, among other things, to allow the United States the right to intervene for quote-unquote the preservation of Cuban independence. Essentially, the Americans were trying to force the new Cuban government to allow the United States to intervene whenever it wanted. To its credit, the Cuban Constitutional Convention refused to include this provision and held out for a number of months. Eventually, though, the political and economic pressure from the U.S. government and the continued presence of U.S. soldiers in Cuba forced the members of the convention to add these provisions to its constitution. The last of the American forces would withdraw from Cuba in 1902. Sadly, they would return in 1906. But that's another story. And there you have it. 
the United States completes its first military campaign to establish itself as a world power, complete with one of the hallmarks of empire, colonial possessions in different parts of the world. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you next time.